So um, as for her scholarship, Martha is uh, the co-author of many books. Um, one of them is on Renoir in the Barnes Foundation. She's written essays about Dugas, uh, Redon. Um, before she was deputy director at the Barnes, she actually um, was an assistant, assistant professor at art history at Drexel. Um, and before that, she served as a, as a curator at the Barnes Foundation, um, where she curated a contemporary exhibition that um, I saw and thought was brilliant um, on Mark Dion, Judy Pfaff, and Fred Wilson. Um, and long before that, uh, you know, she was um, my roommate. <laughs> So um, Martha and I actually spent a, uh, a year together um, in uh, Paris where we were working on our uh, dissertations um, and uh, trying to, uh, you know, get to the library, uh, you know, as, as soon as we could. Um, I put this picture up, Martha, um, to, to delight and surprise you. Um, not to sort of remind us how old we how are long ago but, is that? but how long ago this is quite long oh ago God. we won't we won't say um <laughs> but i put it next to the team um just because i know that that's that's pastry in your uh in your bag uh and of course the soutine is this wonderful oh pastry pastry <laughs> maker so um by way, by way for dear life yeah. <laughs> by way of introduction i wanted to um to uh, as, as a, also as a kind of foreshadow for what we'll be uh, talking to you about tonight. Um, okay, great. So well, our first question. Can I just, can yeah, I just first say, Ellen, thank you. That was so, so lovely and so nice. That made me feel so good. And, uh, you know, right back at you. Um, you are, um, I love, I love looking at art with you. So it's one of, it's one of my favorite things to do. And we got to do a lot of it um, that year. We did indeed. Yeah. Um, would you hear here, by the way, for any of you who are um, interested in, uh, you know, research libraries, I mean, these are also spaces that have great exhibitions in Paris. These are um, two sites of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Um, and these are these are the libraries that I just mentioned before um, as spaces where Martha and I um, did most of our our reading. Uh, and, and when we're writing our dissertations uh, together. Um, but maybe Martha, you could tell us a little bit um, first about what originally um, brought you to uh, the barns um, while I sort of work out the slides. Sorry about this. Here we sure. Go. So it was so, Renoir uh, that brought you go. to the yeah. barns, right? There yeah. So I, um, I had finished my dissertation and the, the topic was not a Renoir topic. It was, um, it was a very interdisciplinary topic about the relationship between sort of evolutionary theory and the body. And I knew a little bit about Renoir, but not a whole lot. Um, and I was, you know, I'd, I'd finished this dissertation on something else and was looking for a job. And there was a job, um, it was a, a Mellon fellowship to um, study the Renoir collection at the Barnes. Um, one of the things, I mean, there's so much to say here, but um, I think one of the things to say just about the Barnes collection before I go into the Renoir project is that, um, you know, it's, it, it is such an unusual place. It has such an unusual history. It was um, founded by this, this man, Albert Barnes, as an educational institution, and he had a particular way of looking at art, where um, you know it was it was about the relationship between forms, you know, sort of visual analogies, and there was not during his time. He died in 1951, and then in the years in the decades after his death, his sort of you know followers, um, I don't know, co-workers kind of took over and kept the place running, but there was the, all of this is to say that there was pretty minimal art historical research that had been done on the collection, which is kind of amazing because it's such an amazing collection. And, you know, most muse museums you go and they will have files on each object in the collection, thick files with like all, you know, past research, interpretation, everything that's been written about it. At the Barnes, there was like nothing. Um, and this was back in 2004. So I got this job. So they wanted somebody to start building to, to build start building up art historical knowledge on the on the Renoirs. 
Um, and why they started with, with Renoir, I'm not really sure. I think um, probably because there are so many of them. There are 181 Renoirs in the collection. So I, you know, I get this job and I'm thrilled because I've got, I, you know, oh my God, I got a job in, <laughs> in the field of art history. Which is like, <laughs> so happy um, coming out of grad school. And, uh, but then I was thinking, um, okay, well, I'm going to be spending the next couple of years looking at a lot of paintings like the one that we're looking at now. And, um, but, you know, I was open to it. I was like, all right, I'm going to learn about, you know, I, I studied 19th century French art. I, I probably should know more about Renoir. So I sort of dove in. Um, and I'll say uh, another thing to say before I really get into the Renoirs is that Barnes's Renoir collection is mostly, it's not the impressionist stuff. It's not, um, you know, the kind of the things that he's known for, like the luncheon of the boating party, the Moulin de la Galette, um, you know, those pictures of sort of French, you know, life in, in the city or in the suburbs. Um, it's a lot of nudes. It's a lot of pictures like this of sort of fantasies of kind of women lounging around in nature or just kind of like rosy cheeked sort of peasant types. Um, and so I start working on this and aside from being overwhelmed by just the number of, I was like, where do I even start? 181, are you kidding me? Um, I, start, I, I, I started feeling within maybe three months of, of doing this project that I, this was, that, that I had, that this was career suicide. <laughs> <laughs> because I would go to, um, I would talk to colleagues or, you know, go to a conference or something and run into people and they would say, Hey, what are you doing? And I would tell them I'm working on the Renoir collection at the Barnes. And the response was nine out of 10 times. How can you stand it? How can you stand <laughs> looking at this artist. How can you stand all the rosy cheeks and you know the, the sort of vacant faces of the women? And um, I, there were, I remember like being really upset by this, not, not because I didn't, not because I disagreed, I, I agreed with that, but I, I was like, wow, people really do not like this artist. A lot of, especially like, people in the art world, I should say. I mean, I know he's a very popular artist, but a lot of like, you know, scholars and curators, it was, the, it was totally the thing to make fun of Renoir. And I'm thinking like, wow, I'm working on this artist that um, nobody takes seriously. Um, and this is, a, this is gonna be a problem. Um, but then I realized like the more I realized that it was actually super interesting that um, people have such a reaction to him. Um, and the more I started paying attention to the way that people react to his art, um, the more I started kind of collecting reactions to him, especially um, negative ones. Um, you know, if you go online and type in Renoir hate, You'll get so many, so many, there are like, there's like a, like a website called I hate Renoir.com or something. And then there's like a, then there was a, there was a, there's actually a movement. Maybe you've heard of this called Renoir sucks at painting. Um, it's, it's, it's like, um, and they would, this, they would stage um, this group. I think it was a group of, it was a group of like grad students. I don't know what field they were in, but they would they would hold these protests at different museums that had big collections of Renoir with signs that said Renoir, God hates Renoir, Renoir is an, is an aesthetic terrorist. And I was just like, what is going on? So I, I, so I turned it into sort of like a, um, I don't know, kind of a, a question, a, a scholarly question. Like, and um, you know, why, why we love to hate Renoir. Don't ask me to explain it right now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah, so that's where how my relationship with the barn started was by diving into this collection. It turned into a book, um, but now I've gotten since then to branch out um, into you know the 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 many other artists that Barnes collected, and um, so that's been a lot of fun. And I and I actually um, I will defend Renoir's painting. 
Well, I mean, you you have this whole like reading of Renoir, which is really interesting, right? That it's, you know, of course the subject matter is important. You're looking at, you know, these kind of creamy biscuit white nudes um, that are, you know, really with these kind of like lush breaststrokes, but you kind of sort of focus on the tactility of it all, right? I mean, it's yeah. not just what Renoir paints, but, you know, the way that the bodies are kind of like inviting a sense of, um, of touch, you know, Absolutely. that like, that there's a whole kind of, and a whole context to understanding this, right? Kind of bringing back that sense of touch at a time when maybe, you know, artists like Renoir are sort of worried about that kind of loss of connection that we have to more primal senses, like the feeling of, of, of things, you know, rather exactly. than what we see. Exactly, exactly. That was such a good, thank you for like, that's such a good summary of, of my idea about the role of touch in his work. Um, and I think that, you know, it's the, it, I'm not the first person who has pointed out that um, Renoir ad addresses the, 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 the sense, your, the viewer's sense of tactility. Um, but um, I mean, it's, especially when you look at a lot of his works together from this period, the bodies are always so velvety, um, you know, pushed, and there are there are so many examples of this, but you know, brought really close to the picture plane so that you you feel like you could touch them. They they almost look like pieces of sculpture that you could touch. But then also the 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 nudes are often in the act of touching themselves, touching not touching themselves, but they themselves are touching. Whether it's you know fixing their hair or gra grabbing the the the, the fabric. Um, he and he um, he in his um, people sort of recollecting Renoir, like his son or his friends, they say things like, well, Renoir was obsessed with touch and Renoir himself said things like, well, I would never think that a nude was finished until I could feel like I could reach out and, and pinch it. And so that his, his interest in touch um, has always been talked about as, oh, well, he's, you know, that's part of him just being a dirty old man. And, um, you know, it's part of his, you know, this idea that Renoir, well. Um, is objectifying women. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, is why, which is probably at the, probably at the root of why a lot of people love to hate him. I mean, I the, think sort of, so. the gender think... politics of these paintings aren't exactly progressive. No, not, not exactly. He wasn't any, and he really wasn't progressive in that yeah. area. Like, yeah. I'm not trying to say that he was a feminist. Yeah. He, he right. for sure was not. And he, he right. said awful, he said things like, you know, women should, really shouldn't think too hard. It's not good for their brains. And they really should concentrate on, you know, um, just, you know, having babies. And so he, and he said he, he didn't like what he saw in the changes happening in late 19th, early 20th century Paris with, you know, this new modern, um, progressive woman. Um, he was, he, he didn't like it. Um, but I think that his paintings are not just about, like, I think that the scholarship that says, okay, these paintings are about Renoir objectifying women, and that's all that they're about. I, I don't think that that's right. I think that that's part of what they're about, but I think that there's more that you can say. And so that's, that's been my interest is, um, because it seemed like for a long time, the scholarship just stopped at that. It was like, there were these um, feminist scholars in the 1980s that started talking about these works as, um, you know, objectification. And it was really important work um, and pointing out all of the ways that Renoir's bodies sort of like are, are submissive and, you know, visually delectable and all of that. Um, and nobody had ever really, actually, it's kind of hard to believe, but pointed that out about Renoir. Um, but then after that scholarship was done, it was like, okay, boom, now we understand Renoir. This is how we're, he became sort of the poster child for um, like the misogynistic male, well, or the, the, the artist who objectifies women. Um, so what I want to bring into it is, I'm not trying to say, again, I, I want to make sure that it's, that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's not what's happening in his works, but that there's more. And I think that um, he was somebody who was so interested in um, in a sense of touch, not just for like lascivious reasons, but because he was a, he started, he was a craftsperson. He loved like 
um, the artisanal, like the old artisanal values of, you know, of old France. And he was living through the industrial revolution and the hand was becoming replaced with the machine. And, you know, so I think that this engagement with of the sense of tactility has to be seen sort of as part of his desire to kind of bring the sense of touch back to the act of looking. And, and, certain, and certainly a kind of more, I don't know, expansive way of thinking about these paintings may in fact account for why people do love them. I mean, if they were just kind of straightforward turning, up, turning women into objects, like maybe they wouldn't, maybe they wouldn't appeal as much, right? Yeah, I mean, there's something yeah. more profound here, right? There's something that's going and, on, that's yeah. addressing, addressing our senses in a way that's more than just what the content is, maybe. Yes, I think so. And, and, you know, and it's hard when you make arguments like this, right, as an art historian, because it's not like you're saying that Renoir was like, I am going to paint this body to restore the lost artisanal value <laughs> that I am experiencing right now. And, you know, like, <laughs> um, it's just sort of bringing like, like, bringing this work back and thinking about it in the context of, um, you know, that, that, that period. Um, so I guess I'm saying that maybe some of it is, I don't know if unconscious is the right word, but, um, but yeah. So I know you didn't, you know, think about Renoir in Paris, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about kind of like how your um, time there, um, you know, really sort of impacts the way you do your work now? I mean, I know that you constantly are going back to the history of um, French art, French modernism, um, but, you know, like, for example, this painting that we're looking at right now, you know, from the, the, uh, the Saint Pompidou, the, you know, the National Collection of Modern Art in Paris, um, you know, it seems to me like I, whenever I see like, oh, Martha's working on a new project or Martha's coming out with a new essay or book, it's like, oh, right. And I kind of connect it in a biographical way to some of the things that we um, we saw together in Paris. Yeah. So, do you feel like that training that you had and that experience of, um, you know, museum collections? And I know you go, you know, to France as well, too, when you're um, when you're doing research, but Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that connection with the city impacts you. Yeah, can you go back to the, um, the slide of the libraries? I, I think so. Yeah, um, the one of, there's one of us with, yeah. Boop. There we go, here's the libraries. Yeah. Um, that, this is us on our break during the library and this is us at the library. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, uh, you and I were both really lucky to have gone to grad school in New York City and then to have done our like our dissertation research in Paris, like cities that have like incredible places to look at art, right? So um, I think about, I, so I think that because of that, and maybe I, I don't know if I, I don't think I took it for granted, but you know, you could be in, in when we were in New York or when we were in Paris, thinking about something, um, writing about something, and then say, you know what, I really just need to go look at this. And like, what, an, what a luxury that was. So I think that it really um, gave me an interest in um, like the, the actual object, the physical object. And, and, um, and probably that's why I am working at a museum because I love being around the art. Um, but I think that, and this is something that Ellen and I talked about, um, well, before that, there, there's also, also being able to do research at these two places that you're seeing here. Um, so the one on, is that the Doucet on the right? Uh, yeah, the one on the right is the, is the, the Richelieu location of the, of the National Library. But um, yeah, the reading room that we, we were in, it's, it's now, it's that's now different. The one, right? it's, yeah, yeah, but that's the one that we spent most of our cold winters in. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one on the left is the Bibliothèque Nationale. At Tolbiac, um, yeah. Yes, and um, Ellen and I had some crazy adventures. I don't know, just, just actually getting to that place. And you'd get on this sort of tube 
and this train would like del would like seal up and then deliver you there and then you <laughs> get up and it was just this gigantic enormous place and um very kind of sterile i mean i guess it's it's it, architecturally important but um to me it felt um it was not the most welcoming um you know it wasn't the, like the beautiful space that you're seeing on the right um but we would go there and by the time we arrived we were like whoo and um but then we would th but then you would sit down and start actually working and start looking at you know thinking about what you wanted to see that day and looking at their catalog you know on the computer oh they have a um, a, you know, a, a pamphlet from the 1878 World's Fair, like exhibition in Paris that year. I think I, I want to look at that. And so you, you would just hit this button and then walk over to a, a, a desk and sit there doing your work. And somebody would deliver that thing to you. And it would be, you know, with their gloves on. And it was like this incredible piece of history that was just like put placed in front of you. And I know that you can probably access a lot of these things digitally, um, but it just instilled for me a love of, of research and of archival research. Um, and I think one of the things, Ellen, that, that we used to talk about was like how much stuff there is, <laughs> how much stuff there is, like how much of that um, that primary source material is still sort of out there to mine. Like you think, oh, every topic's been written about, but no, there's there's still a lot to do. Um, but I think that, I think, and, and this here's another thing that we talked about, I remember this really well, um, coming from the States, coming from, and from a, um, you know, when you say I am going to get a, a PhD in art history, it doesn't always go over so well with, with, with one's parents. <laughs> um, what are you gonna do with that, right? Um, and, uh, and that was, I mean, and my parents were very supportive, but like there was definitely like, really? Um, and, you know, or telling people like, I'm going to Paris to write my, my dissertation. Like, oh, what are you gonna do with art history? That was like the constant refrain. Um, and then, once when we got there, um, we know like we I remember talking to Ellen because we had started noticing that we didn't get that response when we were in Paris. Like, you know, you would meet somebody and they would say, What are you doing? And in my terrible I, I, my French is terrible. But like if I managed to say, um, I'm here studying je te dis de l'art, like, you know, my terrible French. Um, and it was never like really, it was always like, oh. Of course. Really? Yes, like, wonderful. oh, what artist? That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so it was just this being in this culture that so celebrates um, intellectual was, pursuits. Was, I would say it was culture. very, it was very validating. It was, it was very, very validating. validating. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the fact that so much of its like national budget goes to things like libraries, archives, universities, museums. I mean, I think it would make most Americans head spin, right? When they realize like, sort of how much of this stuff is all kind of funded, right? Mm -hmm. And this national library that looks so foreboding on the left, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like centuries of materials. So yeah. um, for any of you, who are interested in this. I know Martha and I are kind of geeking out right now, but for <laughs> any of you who are interested in like a complete um, time, you know, uh, time suck and which, would, which will be like loads of fun. There's actually an English language version of Gallica, which is the online digital collection um, of, of these places. You know, these are two sites of the National Library, but um, the, the, they, they've done a really amazing job um, at digitizing over the, over the past, you know, decades since, since we've spent time there personally. But um, yeah, Gallica, it's, it's like there's an English language version. You just put in keywords and like the, the most amazing things show up. Um, and it's all really kind of well done and obviously very well um, curated, you know. So um, yeah, that's a, it's a it's a treasure. And the next time you are all in Paris, these places all have also also 
have, you know, small kind of targeted exhibitions, which are really interesting. The one at Tolbiac right now has an exhibition about surrealism. So obviously a lot of people, a lot of tourists don't, you know, haul themselves way out to the 13th, um, to the Tolbiac, uh, Tolbiac building that we're looking on the left. Um, but in, in the uh, second arrondissement of Paris, the Richelieu site um, always has really interesting exhibitions. They're small, they're kind of um, a little bit more focused than like the sort of larger museum shows. Um, and they're, they're always a delight. I always, I always learn a ton when I go to those library exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so maybe we should talk about, speaking of exhibitions, maybe we should talk a little bit about the exhibitions that are going on right now at the Barnes. I mean, sure. I'm so dying to get down there. Oh now yeah. That the world is coming back um, and we can go places. Do you, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, de Kooning Soutine show that's happening right now? Yes, yes. Um, so, Soutine. Here's us, by the way, with a, with a, these are also some ancient photos <laughs> of gross. us in the, in, the, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the south of France. And I put it next to a Soutine <laughs> just to jog your memory. This one is a beautiful Soutine from the, from the Orangerie that I know well because we, we give tours of the Orangerie, um, which has an amazing collection of Soutine, but so does the Barnes. So do you want to yeah. tell people a little bit about the, the current show, Soutine de Kooning, Conversations in Paint? I can't wait to, to check it out. Um, you've, this is such a great show. And, um, I'm not just saying that because I work at the Barnes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really beautiful. And, um, it's a great show to see now, like as you're get, starting to get back out into the world, um, because it is all about the paint and the surfaces. And, and so you want to see this in person. It's just not the same looking at it um online um so soutine um soutine if for those of you who, who, who've never heard of him i mean i mean he's not the most well-known artist he's brilliant but um i think he's been he hasn't quite gotten his due um he was he's Lith lithuanian and um born in i think 1893 and um, went to Paris because he wanted to be where, where all the action was and um, lived, you know, lived the, the totally um, just bohemian struggling artist life, made friends with Modigliani, you know, totally sometimes he wouldn't eat because he, um, co he couldn't afford to and he instead was spending his money on art supplies and he, he paints in this very gestural way and he um his subjects are are mostly portraits um uh landscapes um and and he's really i think his most interesting works are his still lives of um dead animals actually oh i have so one he, i yeah. have one um but before you go to that oh okay um, i want to talk about i want to talk about the exhibition before so i know i so so he was working in Paris, um, you know, he got there in 1913. He is struggling, struggling, struggling. Um, Modigliani is, is a fan of his work and they're friends, but nobody else. And he's saying like, everybody, you should look at this guy. He's really good. And um, nobody, nobody liked his work. Um, and then Albert Barnes, um, who had started collecting about 10 years earlier. So, so in 1922, he goes over to Paris on a buying trip. And by then his collection, he had all, you know, he already had amassed um, dozens of Renoirs and Matisses and Picassos. And he was, he was well known by this point as a collector. And, and definitely like when he went to Paris on a buying trip, all the dealers and galleries, they, they knew that he was in town. Um, Cause he would just, he would just, he'd, he'd buy like a dozen paintings like in an afternoon. So he goes to, um, he's, he's visiting Paul Guillaume, um, whose collection is now at the, at the Orangerie. And, um, and I think that what, there are some, you know, you hear the story told different ways, but um, basically what happened was he saw uh, a, a soutine hanging in Guillaume's gallery. Um, and it was the, the pastry chef, the one that Ellen showed earlier. 
And Barnes was just like, who, who is, who is this painter? Like, who, who is this guy? And Guillaume actually didn't even really know that much about him. He's like, oh, he's this guy Soutine. And Barnes was like, I, like, I love this. I've got to see more of his work. And um, so Soutine took him, so, so Modigliani, cut, sorry. So um, Guillaume brought him to um, basically to uh, th this, brought him to see, you know, dozens and dozens of Soutine's works and Barnes like bought them all up. And so, um, you know, he bought between 50 and 60 paintings within the course of a couple of weeks. And so you can imagine the impact that this had on, on Soutine. Suddenly he is not only got some money, but also people are paying attention to his work because Albert Barnes had, had bought them. And so that meant all of a sudden there's like a market for in the, the for his work and the prices start going up within you know within a couple of years and he's got exhibitions in the U.S. and so um, so we still have at the Barnes um, Barnes got rid of some of the those original fifty paintings but we still have twenty one of them they hang in our permanent collection but we've always wanted to do an exhibition about the relationship between Soutine and de Kooning, Willem de Kooning, the abstract expressionist painter, because um, he talks about, might have, I can't remember if it was in a letter or in an interview, he talks about the impact that Soutine, specifically the Soutines at the Barnes, had on his own work. Um, and so we, um, we brought paintings by Soutine and by de Kooning together in this show. And, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's the, the argument of the show is not saying like at any moment um, that this particular de Kooning was based directly on this particular Soutine. It's more just like letting you sort of look at the work of these two artists, um, one of whom was very interested in the other one um, and letting you really look. Um, so it's, if you like, if you like, if you, if you like painting and you really like um, to look at sort of like luscious paint strokes that you can really see and you can really see the artist's hand, this is an amazing show. Um, it strikes, it strikes me, Martha, that, you know, um, you know, this, this kind of pairing of two artists has been a, a format that a lot of, um, a lot of exhibitions have followed in the past year is just like, I mean, it's such a, it's pretty traditional, right? It's kind of the way we were trained as art historians is sort of to look at something you really need to look at something else. So seeing things in comparison is, um, it, you know, has that kind of illuminating uh, quality to it. But I also wonder if it's like particularly suited to the barns because of the whole, um, you know, the ensembles, right? Mm. Like, I, I don't know, people know a little bit probably about the um, the way, the unusual way that the Barnes, um, you know, installs its its collection. I, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that, but it's it, it really invites that those kinds of like vis purely visual comparisons. Yeah. You know, um, um, you know, and I know, and I know personally, just because I've talked to you that that was something that you were, kind of you know you're, you're not you're crazy about in terms of the Barnes method because it basically empties out you know the history of things right I mean I'm showing yeah. um another Soutine now from the Barnes collection which um I just happen to love and I think it it shows people what you're talking about in the detail um on the far right of the screen where you have all these like amazing kind of like layers of glazing and you know I mean it's a cliche but you know, everyone says like Soutine is a, is a, is a painter's painter, right? I mean, it's like the, the, the method and the, the complexity of like the way mm. light travels through all those like, multiple glazes is just kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. But I, maybe it's something that like suits the Barnes because of the way that Barnes strictly designed, you know, what he called those wall ensembles. I'm showing an example of that on the left so people can see, yeah. you know, what what uh, if you went to the barns like how these two teens would would quote unquote normally live mm -hmm. um, and you know you have rooms for me it's really interesting because you have rooms that are 
you know, pairing modern paintings by Cezanne with African sculptures, with, mm -hmm. you know, keys from, from, mm -hmm. you know, uh, rural Pennsylvania. Um, so that kind of close looking, I guess, has sort of been at the core of, core of the way the, the Barnes has always operated, right? Yes. And I've never, I've never thought about the fact that this show is sort of perfect for the Barnes in that way. Like, I don't know why it, it never occurred to me that this is a show about looking and that's what the Barnes sort of educational philosophy has been like kind of historically. Um, but I also know, just to say more, you, sorry, what? sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say to, 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 to just say more about the, the display of the art, um, you know, this is, um, this, the wall that we're looking at here is actually sort of rather empty compared to most of the walls. Um, if we were looking at another wall, you would see it, it would be, you would see that it would be just jam packed with work, really dense hang. Um, and, but like Ellen said, things put together that you would never expect to be in another museum to hang together. So like, yeah, like a, like a, like a ladle from, um, from, um, from, from the American, I don't know, South or something um, with a, with a Cezanne next to a, um, you know, uh, an El Greco next to a, like an African sculpture next to a, a Native American um, blanket rug, like just all this stuff um, mixed together. And so in some rooms it's, he does kind of stick to periods a little bit more than others, but in other rooms, he is just way mixing it up. Um, and it is, it's really interesting and it really is about looking. I mean, that was his whole, his whole idea is that, um, is that you don't, and, and it was, it was coming from this place of, um, wanting art, wanting, wanting art to not be elitist, wanting art to be accessible. And he thought that um, if you could teach about art in a way that really focused on just using your eyes, um, that it would, it's a more sort of fun and kind of like approachable way to look at art um, rather than having to come at it, you know, with this background in history or like whatever classics, you know, he was not necessarily interested in the content of the, of the works, you know, what's represented or the politics of the time that something was painted or the, you know, original historical context. He just, he would put a, a Native American blanket next to a, next to an El Greco um, and just want you to be looking at forms. How are the, how is the arrangement of space different and similar, you know? Um, and I'm probably oversimplifying his philosophy, but, um, but that is sort of the heart of it, you know, use your eyes, just, you know, everything that you need to know about this work is in front of you, like, and you can build it yourself. Um, but there are, you know, there are, there are, it, it can be frustrating at the same time um, to look at the collection when it's hung that way, because sometimes you want to, you just want to see things hung historically or with things that were made, you know, um, in the same era. Um, and it does sometimes, I mean, this, this pure formalist arrangement. Yeah. It, it, it has a tendency to, to drain works of their, of their histories. Um, and so part of my job has been to, you know, it's, it's, been, it's a balancing act at the barns. We want to maintain his display. We want to, so we don't, so there's, there's no explanatory text anywhere on the walls. We want it, we, we have, we maintain his, the, his arrangements. Um, we still teach classes that are, that, that take that historical Barnes method of, of looking of, of pure sort of formal visual analogy. Um, but at the same time, we try to layer in other ways, like sort of newer approaches to art history um, to say, like, yes, we, we can we can look at things according to the Barnes method, but we can also look at things in these other ways. And so if you don't want to just be looking at forms, you can also read about, um, you know, the history of this object. Uh, we've got, so we use technology for that. Um, we've got an, an, a smartphone app where you can pull up and, you know, little texts about any work in the collection. 
So that's that's a that's um kind of interesting question about like what you know the role of people like you and me and all these people who sort of make a living from trying to you know encourage people to 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 interpret art to enjoy art to look at art to make make it a part of their lives and um you know we're all obviously you know reeling from the year that we've had and reassessing kind of like the value of what we do and i think it's a really interesting time to say the least to um to have the job that you do you know with the the museum reopening so yeah. i wonder like when you say you know there are so many multiple ways of interpretation for people to access and to experience these works um do you feel like that's one of your biggest challenges now like really making the collection i mean you are in a urban context in philadelphia there are so many different kinds of audiences that the barnes is trying to reach out to and um you know let people know that the barnes like is is their museum as well yeah um and so i wonder you know if you could talk tell us a little bit about maybe some of the challenges that are facing you now with this enormous task of of being welcoming to so many different audiences yeah i mean that's a great question it's our it's you know it's 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 one of our biggest challenges and, and i mean all all museums struggle with this um trying to sort of get rid of of the perception of the, of the museum as an elitist space um and and i mean really creating a space where everybody feels welcome where everybody feels like yes this is for me this is for me this is you know um i think that one of the real challenges of our collection is the fact that it is a collection of work that is mostly made by um white men and that represents you know white people so there's not a lot of diversity in terms of um like the the people that you're seeing represented in the collection i mean there is some diversity of cultures but like um you know we see we we have a, a really um pretty robust um k through 12 program so we see a lot of students from the philadelphia school district and um like, like twelve thousand students a year or something and you know some 75 percent of them are students uh are, are, are people of color and they're going through the collection and they're not seeing themselves represented um and that's a, a huge issue and we, we talk about we, we we talk about it all the time like how do we deal with this and so our k through 12 team has decided we're just we're going to be we're going to talk about it like we're going to say like you might notice that like everybody in here is <laughs> um i mean i think that the jury is still out on like what's the, what's the right way to, to deal with this and you have to handle it differently with different ages of course but um we we try to just be like transparent and um and to um i mean thankfully we have a special exhibition space where we can bring in new art like you know by um a diverse you know array of, of artists um which is awesome um but i think also there's something i mean i'd like to think that there's something universal about about a, a painting like this so that you can en enjoy this even though you don't necessarily see yourself represented in it you do sort of see yourself represented in it because you are also you know you're a human there's all there's always themes that you can um that you can that you can draw upon and so our our k through 12 team really really works on that um but i think that something that we've learned um so the collection the barns i don't know how if people how much people know about the history of the barns but it was originally in um, a suburb of Pennsylvania, and it was um, as it, sort of ironically, um, you know, even though Barnes had founded it as this place where, you know, it was about art accessibility, it had become um, by, you know, the, by the early 2000s a place that was pretty actually pretty elite 
um, in a lot of ways. Like you would, the only people who went to the barns were really people who were sort of in the know and who kind of knew about this quirky hidden place out in the suburbs. And when we moved, so we, we went through that, there was this big court battle to move the collection to center city of Philadelphia. And part of the, and there were, there were, there was a lot of, um, controversy. A lot of people were against it. But one of the, the, the main arguments that we made for moving the collection was, um, sorry, this is sort of a really long-winded way of, of making my point, but one of the, one of the arguments that the, the leadership of the Barnes made, and this was in, when was this? This was like leading up to the reopening in 2012, was, well, when it's downtown, um, it's going to be so much more accessible and we're going to see such a diverse audience and the, the, our, our visitation is going to reflect the demographics of Philadelphia. And um, of course that did not happen. Um, you know, visitorship was, was like off the charts, like for the first couple of years, but it was still our like sort of white um, kind of older, um, like wealthier audience. And so just moving the collection to a different place did not do what didn't did not advance our like goals for audience engagement and so what we have been working on in the last five years is a lot of program building like you know really active not like going out into the communities um and and i mean there's there's so many so much work being done in this area um, by all, by all museums. A um, lot of really creative work being done, but it's 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 a huge um, issue. Yeah, and a lot more and a lot more work to yeah. to be done. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, it's a good point that we're all at where everyone seems to recognize now that the work does need to be done. So that's that's something. You can't just say, like say like here it is you're yeah, well, like right, it's open right. like, exactly come. exactly you can't just sit back and sort of expect exactly. you have to, right. you have to yeah. right like we're we're cleaning the painting so everything's ready yeah um so I guess at this point I mean um you know I could obviously talk to you for hours but maybe we should see if anybody has any any questions for you Martha I don't know if anybody sure. wants to um. I can't sure. see. Let me see. I'm, I'm going to take the slides down. Okay. If that's all right with everybody. Um, so if anybody has any questions for Martha or things that you are um, curious about, um, you know, I'm sure some of you may know that really fascinating story that Martha just told us because it was um, the subject of probably what was an annoying documentary to you, which was called The Art of the Steel, right? Which made, made the move of the collection into some sort of very um, uh, big sinister. controversy. Yeah, yeah, sinister controversy, which, yeah. you know, given, given the, given the uh, amount of controversy since probably seems that that level of controversy probably see, strikes us all as very quaint, right? <laughs> the, move of, the move of the Barnes collection to um, Philadelphia. Um, but I mean, it's, it is, it is really, I, I think anyway, like a, just a much more, even though it recreates what it was like in, in Marianne, it's a much more dynamic space to see, um, yeah. the collection and also the, the, the contemporary art space, which you didn't have before, you know, really allows you to do some interesting shows. I know you did like the, you, you were able to host the 30 Americans show, you know, which was a traveling show featuring, you know, a lot of black artists and, um, and, and I know that that's a real kind of mission to sort of make sure that people feel like the collection is still relevant by, by putting it in, in, in conversation with more, right. um, more recent art and, um, and more recent ideas, because it's it, like you were saying with the, with the interpretation, every generation and every group of, of people are gonna come back and see those paintings in different ways. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you mentioned a kind of a feminist kind of, you know, acknowledgement of the um, what we might say is the core sexism of of Renoir or and I know that was part of your work, too, with looking at Degas and the sort of misogynistic messages you're getting in Degas. 
And then of course, every generation will have this sort of way of looking that reflects maybe more our values, right? Than anything that's like sort of bedrock truths about these artists and their works. Um, and right. for me, that's like what, why the discipline is still relevant. I mean, I, regardless of what we're saying, we're not making this stuff up, right? But we, we are in fact, um, in selecting the research questions that we have, um, you know, those are informed by like the concerns that we have now, mm -hmm. you know? So I talk a lot in my classes about a sort of binary of gender and the ways in which art kind of has mediated categories of, of male and female, for example. And a lot of my like, you know, 19, 20 year old students are like binary of gender, like that's over, right? So, you know, and, and hopefully maybe they will be the next generation of historians of art who will find a new way to think about these works and to make them relevant to their audiences. They'll just, th yeah. they'll, they'll be a lot more smart about um, figuring out how to get into the libraries too. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so we have oh my goodness we have a question actually it's a comment from um another uh we must admit friend of ours from the paris years um who was largely responsible for um keeping us in uh good spirits you know metaphorically and, and literally um and that's mike boja hi mike he just says i oh, just wanted mike. to extend our appreciation. I vividly remember talking with you both in Paris Sunday afternoon, looking at decorative architecture. Hey, Mike, the Barnes is one of our favorite museums and Soutine is one of our favorite artists. This has been such a unique perspective on looking. Thanks. Mike, Mike. you got to come to Philadelphia. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> um, all right. Well, again, um, if uh, those of you who um, are interested in a little bit more of, uh, you know, art talk, um, we will be having a really uh, great June meetup as well. Um, I didn't feature that in the slide earlier, um, but we'll have, be having a wonderful June Friday night meetup um, with uh, Sarah Gans Blythe, who is the uh, interim director um, of the RISD Museum, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum here in Providence, where I am, my, my kind of uh, hometown uh, treasure. Um, but as I mentioned, you are more than welcome to browse all of our free meetup events. Um, it's in the About Us tab on the homepage of our site. Um, and, um, you know, we have some great classes happening uh, throughout the summer. Um, with this kind of hopefully interactive conversation and small group and close looking um, that I hope you will uh, feel welcome to join. So I'm going to say good night to everyone and I am going to um, thank Martha once again. Thank you. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed our conversation and I, you should check out the other ones that are coming up. I'm sure you all will because they're, they look super interesting. Um, thank you, Martha. Thanks for having me and thanks everybody for tuning in. Say, say say hi to the family. You too. A, a bon weekend. Ciao. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>